Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 710. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 11th, 2022. All right, thank you for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted, where two gentlemen sit down in their chairs in front of their webcams and talk about all things Anglican, the Christian news, the secular news that goes around the country. And we try and compact this into 45 minutes. It often goes an hour. We'll see what happens today. We're up against a time stop. I have to be done by 11.30. We'll see if that happens. George, I woke up this morning, and I was in the polar south. A little cool down here for you. Yeah, so yes, you we get wool suit on there? Well, I've got one of my wool. I've got my wool jacket on. My the wool jacket I have. I've got a tweed one, but uh, no. It uh, on Sunday after church, we went to a, what the community pool in our development and lay out in the sun. It was 80s, beautiful mm -hmm. sunshine. I woke up this morning. It was in the mid 40s. Uh, all the uh, snow and freezing temperatures up north. We're at the southern. We're not Miami, which is still warm. We're about uh, half, about eh, maybe a third of the way down the state. And so we're getting the very, very southern tip of this cold front that's hitting the northeast. Yeah, it's, uh, but we, it's still beautiful here. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. There's still yeah. golf. There, you know, as I was getting dressed, I looked out. There's still golfers teeing off at the first tee time at 7.30. And <laughs> they just they just don't have uh, lo short pants on today. They've got yeah. long pants. Long pants. Yeah, I'm watching the, uh, my neighbors walk by with the, the King Charles dogs, and they're all dressed with their parkas. So, you know, I, I'm in good company down here with the people who think it's a, a tad bit chilly. In fact, what they do down here in, in the, this RV community is people have little plastic uh, coverings that go around their golf carts. So when it goes really cold, they zip it down and they make their little uh, golf carts a, a warm, uh, uh, what type of car was that? I'm sorry. I'm being distracted by drivers going by here. I should, I should have my office studio somewhere else. Um, they don't like cold down here is my, my point, George. Uh, lots of news to cover. Uh, I'm going to bring up my, my notes here. Uh, did we decide on a good story? Uh, yeah, let's, you want to do the cake story? That's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, there's a cake. There's a story that has got the news pop title, uh, the gay cake uh, uh, story, mm -hmm. and that said, a Asher's Bakery, which is a family-owned bakery in uh, Northern Ireland in Belfast, a number of years ago was asked to make a wedding cake by some gay activists that uh, had a pro-gay wedding uh, theme. Well, Asher's Bakery declined. They're Christian-owned, and they're outwardly, avowedly Christian. Mm -hmm. And it went through the British court system, and the and the British human rights uh, people, uh, Northern Ireland Human Rights Board, tried to basically force them to do this. It went to the UK Supreme Court, and they won all the way up the ladder. But the gay activists continued to pursue them and took it to the European Court of Human Rights. And this past week, the European Court of Human Rights upheld the Asher's right not to use their art, and that's how they describe their bakery, sure. yeah. uh, their art in favor of an ideology of which they are uh, opposed. Um, it's sort of the opposite uh, re response that we are seeing in some states in the United States. Well, we, we, um, we had have the this famous baker one. out in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the most famous one here in the United States is the, the Colorado baker who won at the level of the Supreme Court, but that wasn't enough. They keep taking him back to court. Another a gay activist will call and order a cake. He will refuse to make it on the basis of this is art, and you're like it's like forcing me to sing at a gay wedding. You can't do that. Uh, why can you force me to make, to make a cake? I'll make you a cake. I will just not put your message on the cake. You can come here, you can buy a cake. The same with the Irish Bakery. You can buy a cake without your message, any day you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't force us to uh, put your ideology on our cake. The European Court agreed with that. The Supreme Court did not make that decision. The determination of the Supreme Court here in America was that the uh, government of Colorado overreacted in the uh, with the gay baker. Not, not the gay baker, the gay cake. Uh, yeah, person, and so. 
this is a, not as a straightforward as uh, people think because there's a, you know, from, a, from the American past, uh, I think some of us uh, can remember uh, when restaurants were segregated. Mm -hmm. that uh, certain restaurants would not serve blacks and so on and so forth and that was over well that was uh, that was basically forbidden uh, discrimination on that you know if you offer a public service you cannot discriminate on that basis our government now, rightfully said you can't do that because this is yes. food yeah. yeah and some so then people take that principle and apply it to the gay issue mm -hmm. and most recent attack on the baker in Colorado is now that transgender activists are asking him to make a penis-shaped cake that celebrates uh, a man come, becoming a woman or things like that with appropriate wording on it. And the distinction here is that uh, they'll be willing to make you the cake, but they will not uh, basically go along with your ideology. It's akin to going to what you know to be an avowedly Jewish, if you will, bakery and asking them to make a swastika uh, cake and with the intent, in other words, it's not the intent to discriminate or to be provocative with the customer. It's the customer's intent to be provocative with the, the purveyor of a good or a service. Mm -hmm. And in my own heart, I don't quite know where that line lies. At a certain point, you know, you cannot turn away all people uh, for your whims, uh, maybe the soup Nazi can on Seinfeld, but at well, where, where's the line? Where's the line, Kevin? And I'm not sure in my own heart where it is. I haven't thought this through I, deeply, I, but... Well, I think that the line is with the muse. Can I be compelled to perform um, at an event where I don't, which is against my religion, or I don't find uh, politically attractive? Um, if I were a singer, can I be forced to perform uh, somewhere I don't want to perform? Because it's I'm not baking a cake, I'm not making a product. My artistic skill is the product. And wh where can we force that? And if we can force that, can I not just compel you to believe what I believe? Then uh, can you know? Can we just dis dispense with the rest of the uh, uh, bill of rights? You know. And a not, at part of it, what we problem we have is that in a in a in a world where Christ is not centered, um, and where rights and justice and truth are Christ centered, mm -hmm. you then have the phenomena of competing rights: the right of free speech versus the rights for gays to be gay, mm -hmm. the right of association versus the right for the gov the right to be compelled to do something of which you do not want to be part of. Um, it's having lost Christ as the foundation and the flooring. Our legal system really is trying to start getting screwier and screwier. Well, it, it is so, really because right now we have two competing religion religions for what's going on in, in our state versus religion. We have the gender cult mm -hmm. and we have the race cult going on. And mm -hmm. between those two, they're trying to compel what our children are being taught in schools. And that's a whole different ball game there too, George. The latest insanity, I think we've mentioned in the past, the University of Pennsylvania uh, swimming, a swimmer, a man who was uh, on the men's varsity team for three years and his senior year switched to the women's team. Well, he was actually beaten at a recent meet, an Ivy League swim meet, because on the Yale team, there is a woman who's transitioning to be a man who's taking male hormones but still competed as a woman and she clobbered him in the pool and there was pictures and i feel so very sad because there's a picture of the women's swim team from yale and all the girls are dressed in the one piece ones that start at the shoulder go down except for this one person who's wearing a man's suit and she's had a full, complete mastectomy, and the scars are still there, mm -hmm. showing that her chest has been remade into that of a man's. And I don't know this girl, I, or boy, however she cares to be, understand herself, but I just feel so very sad of the confusion that her life has engendered. But here now, is it fair that she, who's taking male testosterone to become a man, is allowed to compete in the 
women's division when the man who has natural testosterone for 20 odd years uh, is allowed to compete against the poor girls who have not taken the shots or weren't born with uh, an X and a Y chromosome. Well, from the nineteen mid-1940s to the late 1980s, we had to deal with this when we went to the Olympics and we had to compete against the Eastern Bloc. Uh, Eastern Germany, Russia, uh, China, um, I said Russia, Soviet Union back then, uh, pumped their athletes full of drugs, uh, the steroids, the testosterone, and we would show up and there'd be a picture of the first place and the second place um, women swimmer and the first place women swimmer was from the soviet union and looked just like uh you know a rocky character uh you know had the the the, the full uh, muscular torso and we would have our you know somewhat normal looking uh second place female uh swimmer winning the silver medal and so it was illegal at one point now it has to be accepted because we have uh, the gender cult uh, trying to take over our thought process and compelling us and telling us what we can say and what we can believe about gender. So if we, if we let the Crazy cake go, world. yeah, if we let the cake go, uh, we'll have to let our own thoughts go. Um, there's a new well, cult the, out there. The, the, church, the, the church of Sweden has now passed in their synod. We mentioned this about six months ago. Mm -hmm that is now compelling its clergy to perform gay weddings. It used to be, well, uh, we're going to have gay weddings, but we won't compel you as a priest to do it. Well, that lasted about a year or two. And now, well, the right for gay people to have weddings is greater than your right of self con of, con of uh, conscience and understanding of scripture. In other words, the, what was, the trajectory is quite clear. Uh, in the Episcopal Church right now, we started uh, Ask Bill Love about uh, the uh, creeping progressive uh, agenda for forcing uh, a one group's views on everybody. And if you disagree, what's the consequence? And you this just goes back 60 years. You, you give just a little bit and you lose everything, you know, a, a generation later. Uh, there, were, there were just some promises made and some nods and winks at general conventions, you know, 50 and 60 years ago. Well, fine, whatever. And then there was the writer trial and uh, the Spong uh, episodes and nobody held anybody accountable. Now you have a church that kicks out people like Bill Love. So it doesn't take long. It takes a generation. All right. So that, that gay cake was our good news story. It went long, but... Uh, in summing up, the UK courts say that no, you can't uh, discriminate discriminate against the, the baker. So that's cool. Uh, next story I have on the list here is the Coptic patriarch says we do not have the authority to uh, ordain women as priests. And I thought we could talk about this here. It's certainly a, a big topic within the ACNA and other denominations. Uh, uh, and <laughs> certainly this week in, in Rome. Let's talk about it, George. What does he say about that? On the occasion of the Orthodox Christmas, uh, Pope Tuedros, which is Arab for Theodore, so I'll say Theodore because I won't mangle the name. Theodore was asked by Egyptian, public broad Egyptian state broadcasting his thoughts on, will there ever be women priests in the Coptic Orthodox Church? And this has been prompted by the news in Europe of the, the decline of the traditionalist wing of the Catholic Church and the rise of progressives in Germany and France and Austria and places like that. And Theodore responded saying, I don't, we don't as a church have the authority because, to have women clergy because there's no biblical basis for such a thing. And he recounted uh, his understanding that you know, Christ made an affirmative decision to choose the 12. There were women who were part of the early community, the Marys, Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. and Mary of Mary and Martha and whatnot. And the yes, they sat at his feet. Yes, they were his first witnesses to the resurrection, but they did not receive an affirmative commission to be apostles and disciples. Therefore, and we draw the priesthood from that understanding, Theodore says, 
therefore we cannot add to that uh, and create women priests unless the whole of the Christian world moves as one on this point. Now you may say, okay, that's fine, that's the Egyptians, why should we care? Well, Theodore's statement has gotten tremendous play in the Catholic world and in the traditional Anglican world because he summarizes in, well, in very succinctly some of the, the, the main objections to women clergy. And why this is such a hot button topic is, well, hasn't this been settled in the Episcopal world since 1976? Well, it's because Francis is worrying a lot of traditional Catholics that he's become an Anglican on divorce and remarriage, that he's become an Anglican on uh, communion for non-Catholics, that he's going down the Anglican road, uh, being slightly satirical when I say Anglican there. Well, no, hold he's on. Going... We've, we've, we've said that he's an Anglican, Anglican wannabe. It's, 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 we're being slightly satirical here, but, you know, we, we need to face Fran facts. Francis has set up commission to study women, deacon, women in the diaconate. Not mm -hmm. deaconesses, but women deacon, deacons. And the way the commission is sort of set up, what we're hearing from the chatter is that, you know, you'll set up the commission with the idea, here's the answer we want to get, now find me the way to that answer. So we're going to have women deacons. Well, we'll see the same thing happen. If that's the case, we'll see the same progression that we saw in the Anglican world, that ontologically speaking, theologically speaking, uh, if women can become deacons, then there's no reason why they can't become priests. And if they become priests, there's no reason why they can't become bishops. So traditionalist Catholics are looking at uh, Theodore's words as sort of a a clear signal, a line in the sand saying, you know, Francis, this is exactly what John Paul II said. John Paul II said, I don't, as Pope, have the ability to unilaterally change this thing, this. Where Francis, you're hinting that you have the ability. I, and, now, and of course, I, it's all I, oh, the authority. Yeah. And it's all tied, of course, into the Latin mass controversies mm -hmm. versus vernacular masses and but this little Egyptian TV interview is sparking a wider ring of circles on the pond after the stone was tossed in than anything I've seen in a while on this issue. Yeah, I, well, the ACNA has discussed this and has actually voted on it at the uh, uh, House of Bishops level where they said, as a group, we agree that uh, women's holy orders is extra biblical. I, I forget the word they used. Um, outside the bonds of scripture, something like that. Yet it's a practice within the ACNA, and we as a body have not chosen whether or not to fully support it or fully uh, uh, deny it. And so that's been playing on now for more than 10 years in the ACNA. Other denominations have accepted women's orders and have kept them, except for one. I think a Polish church uh, we talked about once, uh, some small denomination rolled back and gave up on women's orders. But other than that, once it's instilled in your uh, denomination, it's it's usually there at the stage, George. Yeah, and this ties into the Beth Moore uh, flap that we spoke of a uh, recent episode. Beth Moore, very prominent Southern Baptist uh, mm -hmm. uh, teacher, writer, personality, teacher. Mm -hmm. as jo has entered the Anglican Church of North America. And she ba Baptists, her, her detractors in the Southern Baptist world are saying, look, she's on her, the road to ordination in the, in the Anglican world. She really wanted to be a minister and a priest all along. And it's good that she finally outed herself and went to a hellbound denomination uh, to join her colleagues on the road to perdition. So it's it's funny because you, th you you would if you were a uh, if your source of news about religion came from the mainstream media you would have thought this is old oh, this is past this is you know yet this is our grandfather's fight mm -hmm. yet here it is 2022 and we're seeing it from the Baptists to the Coptic Orthodox to the Anglican Church North America to various Lutheran groups. Um, 
who are as bitterly divided as our Anglican groups on these points. The, in some respects, this mirrors the fight over abortion in the United States, because instead of allowing the fight to be settled in the legislatures where the popular will of the people sort of drove the agenda, there was an Enron and the courts from top down mandated it. And now we've got 30, 40 years later, uh, that could be undone by popular will of the people. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating point to see. Um, now, when we share this, we're not at, I'm not offering, and I don't think Kevin is, a personal view for or against. It's not worth it. Uh, it that's above my pay grade. You, George, you would say that's above your pay grade. Um, uh, my basic understanding, and I've dealt with this my entire Christian life, is if I'm at a church, I work with what I got. You know, God, if God has me at this church, I work with what I got. And th th <laughs> I can't ask any more of my Christian brothers and sisters to do the same. So... But, but what I think I find most exciting is that this is forcing people back into the Bible. Mm -hmm. In other words, the early arguments within, well, I can, my knowledge comes from the Anglican world. The early arguments in the Anglican world were not scriptural. They were sociological. They were theological. They were pseudo-historical. Priscilla and Aquila, were they men? Were they, was Prisca a man or a woman? And it's almost like a Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. I mean, trying well, to, to find something based on that. I, but, I need to stop. Hold on. What they did in the Episcopal world was rebellion. Okay, they were going to take it up in con general convention. But instead, was it Philadelphia? Where did they leaven? Yes, or, Philadelphia. Ph Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Uh, Eleven uh, women were ordained into the Episcopal Church outside of the permission of general convention mm -hmm. and so that was done that was that was done in rebellion i can't say that they had a whole lot of theological anything going on there when at the end of the day they said let's rush the process screw general convention let's just do it and that's my difficulty right now with women's ordination is there was not a thorough process done in the episcopal church but Today, the good news is, is that people are going back to the Bible and not relying on important disciplines like sociology. I'm not, mm -hmm. not gainsaying sociology of religion and whatnot, but I do think at the end of the day, scripture is the guide for these issues, mm -hmm. informed by tradition and by our human reason. The Catholic Church has these groups of, uh, you'll see these newspaper articles about women Catholic priests uh, who have been ordained. and they basically are doing a Philadelphia 11 within the Catholic Church of having some uh, retired Vietnamese bishop ordained people. Um, there's this famous story of uh, on a boat on the Danube. Uh, a bishop was you know, in Czechoslovakia under communism. Uh, there were women, underground women priests, uh, because the same thing that the first woman priest in the Anglican world was Florence Lim Te O, who during Hong in Hong Kong, Japan, Second World Hong War, Kong. all the yeah. Hong Kong, yeah. Second World War, the Japanese occupied Southern China and Hong Kong. The white, all the uh, Chinese male priests were either rounded up or killed. Uh, the European priests were rounded up, and basically the women, which religious workers, were left alone. And uh, I think it was Bishop Hall decided to ordain Florence from a deaconess to a priest in order to allow the celebration of the Eucharist while the, pri the priests were all, you know, in hiding or in prison. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened in Czechoslovakia in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and women priests were ordained. And then once the walls came down, they basically, no, not anymore. And so the, out of this tradition, you have recent innovations like the women ordained on a boat in the Danube uh, by uh, somebody from this tradition uh, and saying they're real Catholic priests. I'm not, 
<laughs> You've got the jets taking off next door to you, Kevin. No, that's oh, a furniture mama. truck. That's a furniture truck. Well, the, the problem, George, is we have really good microphones, so any outdoor traffic gets picked up real quick. And But, you know, there's that reality is we have our experience that I can name uh, women priests who I trust and would, would serve with because of the experience and the reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I fully understand the difficulty the ACNA is having in this where a lot of the bishops when it came down to the vote they said listen we do not agree with women's ordination but the cat is out of the bag there's not a lot we can do to pull back uh this and we're just gonna see how it plays out all right whatever you know i i I could you know kevin is not coming down on one side or the other here on camera uh and george probably isn't going to either but it's, this is a reality that will continue working its way within the church because there was never a really good theological discussion or decision by general convention uh, that was not prompted by the rebellion. And I, now I don't the work think I, is, Go on. No, well, the work is being done now. Mm-hmm. And on a theological, sociological, scriptural basis, that is so encouraging and so exciting Oh, Kevin, who was your first co-host? His name just went out of my head. William you were Witt. Up Bill Witt. Bill Witt. Bill, Bill, Witt. Yeah. Bill Witt is an evangelical. He's a professor at Trinity Seminary. Mm-hmm. And he has written some wonderful stuff on, women, on the merits of women priests within the Anglican and Christian tradition. And that sort of work done by people of the caliber and, in, and integrity of Bill Witt wasn't done at first. It's being done now, and I, I I think that's a wonderful thing for our church and for all churches. The discussion, once again, George and Aaron are not taking sides. Don't go, you're so pro, you're so anti. No, nope, no, nope, we're trying to just lay out the story for you. You know, we know what a trigger this issue can be. All right, and just so hear us out. You know, Anglican Unscripted is not coming down on one side or the other, even though we probably both agree. And we probably don't even know each other's position because we really want to keep this as clear as possible. George, let's move on to another story. We got uh, like uh, 15 minutes left in the program. Rod Thomas, a bishop in the UK, is retiring. And it's notable because it wasn't on the Dyson website. They didn't make a big deal out of his retirement. And more notable this week because of who gets to choose the successor to Rod Thomas. What's the story, George? Rod Thomas is the Bishop of Maidstone. That is the flying bishop for conservative evangelicals in the Church of England. Uh, he's a suffragan, technically, of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Hold it. Now, Ego, here, hold, hold, great chance to, to let new audience members know, what's a flying bishop? Flying bishop is a bishop who does not have a geographical see, but has area across many dioceses, uh, to provide uh, pastoral and liturgical and sacramental services for those who are opposed to women clergy or to the theological bend of the establishment. We have flying bishops for Anglo Catholics in the province of York, uh, Bishop, Bishop Beverly, uh, uh, Richborough in the province of Canterbury, in the Diocese of London, we have Bishop of Fulham. And then we have one evangelical flying bishop who covers, I think, both York and Canterbury, if I'm not mistaken, and that's Rod Thomas. And Rod was a very senior figure in General Synod among conservative evangelical circles. And he's been, uh, he's announced his retirement this October. Now, the circumstances that Kevin was alluding to to the announcement of the retirement are, I think, interesting from a press perspective. It's not on the website of the Diocese of Maidstone. Uh, it's not on the, it wasn't coming out of Evangelicals Now, the magazine newspaper of which Rod was the uh, chairman of the board. It came out of the English Churchman, an independent publication uh, whose publisher, uh, Chris Pierce, friend of this show, mm-hmm. he had the story before anybody else and Rod Thomas made sure he had it. Now, why would Rod do that? Well, it came the same week that Stephen Knott was appointed the Archbishop's Appointment Secretary. And Knott is the married uh, married or partnered gay man. He's actually married 
in mm -hmm. the Scottish Episcopal Church. He's going to be the one who picks Rock Thomas's successor. Now, if you want to cause hysteria, more than the general hysteria, you have an out gay man who's an activist on this issue responsible for picking the uh, successor to Rod Thomas. Now, of course, they'll have two choices. Yeah, it's a pick a card, any card, and you'll get the card the dealer wants you to have. That's right. There's an episode of, yes, uh, Prime Minister on the, the appointment of bishops of the Church of England. And it was over 40 years ago. It's still as pertinent today as it was when it was then. But the question is, this is Stephen Knott's first test. Is he going to be able to put out somebody whom conservative evangelicals recognize as one of their own, as one who will be able to stand for what they stand for, to provide what the flying bishop provides for, or will this be somebody like Justin Welby, who was called an evangelical, but whom other evangelicals would not call an evangelical. But for the establishment, he's a evangelical. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. All right, so that's the story with Rod Thomas. Let's get down here. Do we have here any last stories? Oh, the Russian Justin story. Justin Welby. Yes, Justin Welby has an unforeseen ally. Uh -huh. we've, report, we've reported on the flap over Christian persecution of Jews and a Jewish persecution of Christians in Israel and the Palestinian territory. The alleged pers Jewish persecution of Christians, absolutely, yeah. And could you mention who you're going to have on to talk about this? I am going to have on a priest from an Anglican church in Jerusalem uh, talk about uh, the real story uh, and tell us what he can tell us without uh, uh, hurting political ties. We'll see what happens there. Uh, about what real persecution looks like in Israel, uh, what... Uh, uh, wait for the interview. Uh, hopefully I can talk okay. to him Thursday or Friday, but uh, I'll be talking to uh, Father David Pligley. So it'll be fun to talk. Well, Welby uh, backed a statement and co-authored an op-ed in the Times by the Anglican bishop in Jerusalem that blamed Jewish uh, settlers for persecuting uh, Christians in the Palestinian territories and in Israel. The response from Jewish groups and conservative groups was that this is nonsense. The number of Christians in Israel has grown dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of Christians in Palestinian controlled territories has declined rapidly because they don't want to be under the Muslims because of all these incidents of being forced to pay the jizra, the, the tax for religious minorities, being persecuted, of having their churches built, destroyed, and their homes ransacked because they're not Muslim. Well, Justin Welby pushed back and sort of moved the goalposts and said, well, I'm against all persecution. Well, good old Kirill, or Cyril, as you Cyril. would say in English. Yeah. Cyril, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, has jumped in and given Justin Welby his wholehearted support about the Judaist uh, radicals, the Judaist terrorists. You know, it's like Islamist terrorists. Kirill has come up with Judaist terrorists persecuting Christians in the Holy Land and how this is terrible, and the Russians must act to protect uh, Christians who are being persecuted. Now, for those with historical memory, this was the reason for the Crimean War of the yes. 1850s. <laughs> the Russians, the Russians want, wanted to go to war with the Ottoman Turks because the Russians claimed they had to protect the Christian holy sites for the Orthodox in Israel, and the English and French, and Sardinians, and the Turks all said, no, you don't, you're just trying to move south Things never change. <laughs> Patriarch is doing what his predecessors politically did 150 years ago, 170 years ago. Yeah. So, so I but hope now Justin Welby, Justin Welby has this guy in his corner, and I think he's not probably too happy with that. <laughs> no, uh, George, I can't. Uh, crazy. All right, so 
that's the show for this week. We've got all the stories covered. Uh, I'm going to tape again. Even though I have the interview with David Blakely, hopefully George and I can get on the taping then on Friday, and we'll let you know what's happening the rest of the week. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 710 of Anglican Unscripted.